This one is a rare survivor. The vehicle is reputed to be the, the oldest motorized ice cream float in the world. Um, it dates back to 1924. However, looking at the, the body it's sitting on at the moment, that's a, a 1930 Morris Cowley. And it started life in 1924 on an air-cooled Rover 8 body. And the ice cream float was built on the back of the body. But after two years of its working life, it was decided that the Rover 8 wasn't sufficiently powered to, to pull the ice cream on the float. So uh, Arthur Hunter bought a Singer saloon and took off the cabin of the, the saloon and replaced the the back of the ice cream float as you see it today and, and put that on the back of the, the Singer saloon and he, he ran with that for, for another 10 years and then in 1936 he decided to chop up a, a Morris Cowley and it was in fact a, a two-door uh, sports Morris Cowley and he took the back off that and replaced the back of the ice cream float as you see it today and transferred that to the Morris Cowley and, and it then did another 30 year service on the, on the Morris Cowley body. The patch-up and make-do life of this van is typical of many early delivery vehicles. It all started at the end of the First World War. During the war, lorries progressed from unreliable overweight experiments to dependable trucks. For service to king and country, demobbed soldiers were rewarded with bleak employment prospects. Jobs were scarce. But there were plenty of ex-army trucks. Many were snapped up by war veterans, eager to make a living from their newfound driving skills. While they were all right on the open road, army lorries were too big and clumsy for use in small towns. This was the only competition for war surplus trucks, the Ford Model T. Though assembled in Manchester since 1911, originally it had been designed for America's farmers. Ground clearance was high to avoid chassis damage on unmade roads. The suspension was robust to withstand the battering from ruts, boulders and deep mud. By contrast, the abuse a British greengrocer could throw at it was insignificant. The T was an ideal commercial vehicle, easy to drive, simple to maintain, and above all, cheap. With a variety of utility bodies on offer, the ubiquitous T had the van market to itself until 1924. Hello. Hello, dear. Had a good day? Yes, rather. I say, I wish you'd been with me. I've been to Cowley. You know, where they make Morris cars. That's awfully interesting. Tell us all about it. This time before dinner. Yes, Daddy, do. It is a marvellous scene of beautifully organised industrial activity. There is no sense of rush or bustle. Every man seems to have plenty of time to do what he has to do. There is nothing skimped, and as a result, the quality of the work, as well as the quantity turned out, is extraordinarily good. With the emphasis firmly off anything as vulgar as quantity, Morris clearly appealed to the genteel values of middle-class England. Like Ford's T, cars and vans were built using a common chassis, so Morris was able to offer the first British-designed competitor to America's industrial giant. This van is a bullnose Morris Cowley built in 1924 and was an early attempt by William Morris to have a traveler's representative's van. Um, as you can see it's a bit on the small side And this is one of the reasons why it wasn't very successful, because there was very little space inside. I think it's rather individual. 
It set everybody thinking, I think, of a market for commercial light vehicles. The working life of this commercial traveller's van started when only one household in 50 owned a car. Home delivery from high street shops created a need for a really light general tradesman's van that would never be expected to travel much beyond the parish boundary. The little Austin 7 was the perfect answer. Launched in 1923, it was again based on a car. The highly reliable Baby 7 boasted such mod cons as electric starting and brakes on all four wheels. In Britain's carless suburbs, door-to-door -door delivery was an essential service. The high street van became a competitive business asset and traders without one found themselves at a disadvantage. Towns and villages near these suburbs expanded and benefited from this small boom in domestic trade to the well-off. During the Depression in the early 30s, these cheap-to-run light delivery vans flourished. The Little Austin was joined by other car-based rivals, like the first Morris Minor. This one was built in 1932. Ford's Y-Type was a commercial version of their appropriately named popular saloon car. The cheapest of the lot, at least in terms of running costs, were three-wheel light parcel vans based not on car technology, but motorcycles. This 1934 rally was powered by a V-twin engine which thumped away inside the cab with the driver. Not exactly works of art in themselves, many vans were beautifully liveried with hand-painted sign writing. These are the tools of the train. That is a mile stick, commonly called by sign writers a rest stick. And that is a pallet board with dippers. And these are the brushes. In days gone by, most bands were sign written. People used to like to advertise their shops and their produce and so forth. When I started work on my own, I wrote a van and they um, wanted a swan and it was called Swan Farm Dairy, Great Brockenhurst Farm Lie. And I got the, the chance to do all the milk marketing board, including some yogurt vans. Really, it's just hand skill and knowing brushes and the paint to use. I did this fan. It was a woman holding up curtains out of a washing machine and the caption was, Die in your washing machine. The first one I done, the woman might resemble somebody and they were a bit afraid of that. So they gave me a drawing of a Mrs. Wooden Top and I altered it. Well, I think I re preferred the original one for the Mrs. Woodentop, but they wanted Mrs. Woodentop, so that's what it had to be. To really cut a dash, the van itself could be transformed into the shape of a product traders went to amazing lengths in their quest for publicity. I can remember one of the laundry companies, Collars, they used to have a special streamlined body on their vehicles. Very attractive, very eye-catching, and it stuck in your mind. It was a very good advert. Then there was McLean's toothpaste. In fact, I've got an example of one here actually now just look at that and that was an actual van the driver sat there and of course the goods went in the back but it was attractive it was eye-catching and people looked at it 
And I suppose in those days it was just as good as a television advert today. The England's Glory Match Company exploited the arts of sign writing and coach building in the extreme. They built and decorated the world's smallest Austin 7 for their three foot, 10 inch driver. In contrast to this flamboyance was the restrained dignity of the red and black livery of the post office. Unlike other traders, the post office ordered its vans in bulk. It had fleets of identical vehicles. Today, hidden away in a disused aircraft hangar, are the few precious survivors of those vast fleets. These are direct descendants of the 18th century mail coaches. The scarlet and gold, a legacy from the royal founders and their ex-military coachmen. Beneath the dignified paint, mail vans have always been standard production models beefed up by post office coach builders for security. So post office vans have tough teak floors, cab operated locking bars, and fire extinguishers, not for the van, but for the mailbags. Despite the growth of trucks, railways remained the arteries of the nation. Mail, like other freight, always went long distance by train. To collect from sidings, a special type of truck was needed. Not a van, but a tug to pull carts. Unique three-wheeled articulated vehicles like this 1936 Scammel were developed for the four major rail companies. Called the mechanical horse, it would have its heyday in a new socialist Britain that emerged from the Second World War. This is the post-war version of the mechanical horse in the new nationalised livery of British Railways. It was called a scarab after the best of lorries, scammel, and the best of horses, Arab. These vehicles really replaced the animal. They replaced the, the horse. You could couple this up to any trailer. You'd get one of these, it'd go off out and do general deliveries. And while it was away, there'd be loaders in a railway depot They'd be loading other trailers, perhaps one with animal skins, um, another one with bales of hops. And then when the vehicle come back, you dropped your empty trailer off in the yard and you'd go to the office, you'd get your delivery notes and you'd say, go and pick that load of animal skins up on trailer, whatever the number was, and deliver that to Bermondsey. Today, British Railways have a fleet of some 10,000 tractors and 29,000 trailers, a proportion of approximately three to one. One scammel scarab with two or more trailers can often carry out the work of two or more rigid vehicles with consequent savings in outlay and operating costs. The success of the mechanical horse was in its manoeuvrability and its clever coupling mechanisms. Uncoupling from one trailer and coupling to another has become a matter of seconds. The mechanical horse is reversed so that the ramps on the rear of the chassis engage with the flanged wheels on the undercarriage or trailer portion of the coupling gear. As connection is made, notice how as the ramps are inclined, continued reversing raises the front end of the trailer, 
At the same time, the trailer brakes and rear lights are automatically engaged, and the trailer is thus securely locked in position. The driver will tell you its simplicity itself. Nothing to it. That was a very low-geared vehicle. Um, very noisy, I might add. You know, they could always do in another gear. It was very manoeuvrable. Um, it was all right if the trailer brakes were working efficiently, which half the time they wasn't. I would think in its time you'd got to say it was a good, sturdy mechanical horse. But it's nice to be back in one, even though it was a bit uncomfortable. After nationalising the railways, the new Labour government honoured its pledge to do the same with road transport. They met vigorous opposition from the Road Haulage Federation, who ridiculed the idea of a bureaucratic central control. No food, no houses, no coal, but millions of forms to fill hundreds of offices with thousands of civil servants to fill in millions more forms. That is government control. I am commanded by the commissioner to refer to your application for one spare sparking plug. And I am instructed to inform you that you have omitted to complete form number 360... But despite these protests, the nationalised British road services was born. Well, the days when I learned to drive, I was only 11 at a time. We didn't have the luxuries of cell starters and things like that. We didn't even have a windscreen. But the vehicles gradually progressed, and I started driving 1936, 37. Dick Peter's garage, with its spare parts and red-painted tools, is a shrine to the time he spent with the state-owned British road services. You nearly always, say 80% of the time, had your own vehicle. And of course the result was that people used to look after them. Uh, if I can divert from it, a colleague of mine, he'd go and have his evening meal when he'd parked up and then he'd come out and hose and polish the vehicle down in his own time. That's the kind of enthusiasm the job produced. Men love their vehicles. Well, it's a 1947 and it just predates the batch bought by BRS parcels for workshops runabouts. They were bought as workshop hacks. The idea being, of course, that if anybody with a five-ton vehicle on C&D work, collection and delivery work in the narrow city streets had a minor breakdown, petrol blockage or something silly like that, and send, instead of sending a ten-ton breakdown out to deal with that, they'd send one of these out with a trolley jack and a spare wheel and a set of tools and a few spare, spare car and a spare dynamo and that kind of thing to get whoever was stuck out of trouble. All the driving has given me far more pleasure than what it ever has misery. There's been moments, of course, of distress. Who, who doubts that? Foggy nights, deep snow and things like that, things we don't very often get nowadays, all added to it. But it was recompensed by the sheer joy of being your own governor. Once you got out on the road from the firm with a load of goods to deliver, it was your responsibility and yours alone to make sure they got there safe and sound, on time if possible, and then you found a return load and came back with it, and that was another round journey completed safely. And it was, it was a lovely feeling of, of elation to know you'd done a good job satisfactorily. There were exceptions to socialist uniformity. Small high street traders delivering their own goods locally escaped state control. All vehicles, including vans, were in short supply in the late 40s. Most were pre-war designs, like this 1940 Austin 8 model. Or the weird Trojan with its twin-cylinder two-stroke engine. The Jowett Bradford's design dated back to the early 1920s and was considered old-fashioned even then. Morris caused a ripple of excitement in 1949 with the release of this J model, with pressed steel panels, sliding doors and space-efficient one-box shape it at least looked like a genuinely new idea. Although a lot of people liked them, it gave a lot of drivers terrific back trouble for the reason 
that there was a fully forward control effort. In other words, there was a tin front and a windscreen, but the engine was in the cab between the seats. And the consequence of that was that if you kept the tyres at proper pressure, it's just like riding on two solid tyres at the front. You've got every jolt. And there's only a, a very thin seat to sit on, sort of, which didn't help matters at all. So for that reason, they weren't at all popular, although actually there was a quite reliable little vehicle. They gave very little trouble as such. The trouble was that beneath the delightful sculpted curves of the Morris J lurked a primitive chassis from the 30s. British van design was stagnant. <laughs> As with the Ford Model T, again it was the Americans who showed the way forward. In 1952, the British branch of General Motors produced a completely new type of van, the Bedford CA. The history of the CA van is probably unique in as much that it was designed as a van rather than an adapted car. It was revolutionary, using large pressed steel panels, larger than and had previously been used, all steel construction, no wooden framing as the 40s vehicles had been, and a good engine, reliable, very strong cruciform chassis. A vehicle like this could be used for all sorts of other variations. When the CA van was introduced in 1952, it had no indicators, it had no sliding windows, Therefore, the driver had to open the door and do hand signals. E even the passenger seat was an optional extra. The reason so few survive, I think, is because it's a commercial vehicle. If you've driven a van, you'll know that you don't treat a van with respect. Vans get thrashed. Therefore, you don't see old vans on the road. Simple as that. This van is just very lucky to have survived probably suffered more in my use. But I like this van and I like using it. I feel I should preserve it. I should be looking after it. It's survived this long. But I enjoy using it. There's always the possibility that, that my ownership may be its last. The Bedford was the beginning of a new, tougher world for van makers. Increasingly competitive production methods signalled the end for Britain's smaller manufacturers. And as the old high streets changed from family businesses into national chains and supermarkets, it spelled the end for service from door to door. Classic Trucks looks at some classic emergency vehicles next Tuesday at 8 o'clock. And the book Classic Trucks by Nicholas Faith is out now in most bookshops, priced £16.99.